what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's so much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Hi, welcome to On the Waterfront. And I'm your host, Mariah Riggs, director of the Main Street Landing Performing Arts Center. Tonight, I'm excited to be hosting Jim Lockridge, a dear friend and founder of Big Heavy World. Jim Lockridge has directed the Independent Music Office for over 25 years now, starting back in 1996. Um, it is channeling uh, the local and national support of inclusive preservation and promotion of Vermont-made music. He co-founded and manages a community radio station, which probably most of you have heard, called The Radiator, and participates on boards that coordinate program and advocacy among the cultural heritage, tourism, and creative industry. James was recently recognized by the Vermont Arts Council with the 2019 Margaret Canestein Award for Arts Advocacy. Uh, welcome today, Jim. So Thank nice to have you oh, yeah. here. Happy to be here. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think it's important to talk. I want to know this because I don't think I've ever covered this with you. Um, I want to get in a little bit to Big Heavy World. And I've always wanted to ask you this, but I've never gotten a chance. How did Big Heavy World start back in 1996? Oh, that's, that's the quick answer. I, I was a graphic designer back then, and the Internet was brand new. It was a whole new platform to, you know, play with mm -hmm. for publishing. And I started it because I lived in a band house and was surrounded by uh, music and live music in my, my life and wanted to publish about local music to the Internet. And, uh, and so Big Heavy World was born that way as sort of a guide to uh, who the local bands were, what they sounded like as an encyclopedia. Um, and... It, uh, it became more and more broad in what it tried to do to support local music, put out compilation CDs, started live streaming from the clubs downtown, um, and you know, ended up where it is today with a few projects that, uh, that continually support local music or preserve it. What was the music art scene like back in 1996? Some of our some of our viewers might not remember back then. What was well, it like? Well, there's officially, I think that uh, you know, the wide world would say that alternative music was a new big thing then. Here in Burlington, we had so many different kinds of supremely talented artists. It's like it's it's kind of silly to put one name for a genre on mm -hmm. all of them, but it was a very vibrant scene mm -hmm. because it was so eclectic. But not only that, in Burlington, all these very talented musicians in separate bands would, on very special nights, sort of come together from different bands, create these super groups, and these events that if you weren't there, you were going to miss it and never see it again for the rest of your life, you know, some special event. Um, and, and so there was this culture of sort of collaborative, diverse talent that we were just immersed in. And... That's, you know, it was, it was a very high point, I think, for, for music in, in Burlington or Vermont. And, and, and so, so it sounds almost like it was this culture where people would have meetups. You know, like people would come in, there'd be different musicians, and they'd actually just play together? Well, I think, I think part of, I think fundamentally musicians locally knew each other and respected each other. You know, the talent was real. It wasn't, you know, a community of pretender musicians. Everybody was very high level. Um, and, uh, you know, and that just lent itself to the community acting like a community, yeah. which was nice. Yeah, where you could almost pick up and have, and have musicians just participate on the same level, yeah. which, is, which makes things so much more vibrant. I, uh, I, lived, in, I lived in Austin, Texas for uh, several, many years, actually, and uh, that was something that was part of the culture, is you had a lot of exceptional musicians, and that's something that's always drawn me to Burlington. Burlington has a culture of incredible musicians. And so, you know, when, when everybody is at a certain level, it lends itself to everybody to be kind of be able to pick up and be creative together, right? Because uh, everything's as good as the sum of its parts, right? Well, it, it's, uh, it, it was a really perfect time to be interested in local music, to be trying to help 
promote it, ex accelerate it, uh, and you know capture it for posterity as well. So that you know that's what Big Heavy World's energy was. It was also from the start. Um, it was started as a website, and I mentioned I was in a band house, and the band house was a band called Chin Ho, led by Andrew Smith, who published Good Citizen, a zine. And, uh, and Andrew didn't have an interest in the internet, and he was surrounded by a culture of people supporting music through the print zine. Mm -hmm. Big Heavy World brought people interested together in promoting local music with the internet as the tool for that. And so there was this sort of sympathetic energy concentrated in this one place and sort of leveraging each other. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, Big Heavy World is comprised of a crew of volunteers who are mostly younger adults. Yeah, that, I mean, that's something, too, that I'd love to talk about. I think uh, Big Heavy World has been sort of this incubator space for young creatives for a very long time in Burlington. Um, and that's one of the great things that Big Heavy World has brought to this community. Uh, what, what led you to want to want to start doing that? Oh, gosh. It's, uh, I think this is going to be personal versus institutional, but I, somehow or other in my head, I've ended up feeling that it's important that people start early in life realizing that they they should have self-confidence. They should have a sense of valuing their opinion and uh, expressing critical thought and uh, being a part of the community without feeling that they aren't good enough to be a part of the official community. So there's this whole interest in general empowerment of community members. Mm -hmm. I don't like being born into a world where unless somebody points out that you actually do belong here and have a, a role to play, mm -hmm. you end up floating through life getting bumped around by other people who have figured that out. And I want young people to understand that early enough in life. Mm -hmm. So at Big Heavy World, we have this whole suite of different programs and projects and special projects that open the door for people to do very professional, meaningful things that contribute to Vermont's cultural legacy mm -hmm. or the success of an economic sector, mm -hmm. but they get to step into it without having professional acumen, you know? It's like, <laughs> there it is, let's go, and, and we figure yeah. it out for, you know, together and, and, and make things happen that way. And that's a huge problem in production and in any sort of art industry is getting that experience. Um, you know, it's very easy for people like, oh, what experience do you have? And you want to get into it, but you aren't able to get that experience. And Big Heavy World allows people to have interest and excitement and get that experience in something that they're passionate about. I, I think a lot of the time it works out that way, most of the time. So you don't, whether you come in to help with the museum or the archive or with producing a radio show, you know, nobody leaves without knowing how to coil a cable over under, you know? It's like very <laughs> essential skills are learned there. So, uh, you know, another another thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, Big Heavy World also includes the uh, famous Burlington radio station, the, radio, the Radiator, which is at 105.9. Um, how did the Radiator start? Oh, well, there was a very short window way back in the year 2000 when the federal government allowed Vermonters to apply for a very small uh, uh, strength radio license. And I understood, and our friend Lee Anderson from Radio Beam understood mm -hmm. that cooperative applications were, were more competitive than applications that had a single applicant. And so we worked together to apply for a license to have a radio station that could be a platform for our local creative community mm -hmm. so that it would be hyper local with nothing syndicated, only local people doing, you know, bringing the voice of the community to the airwaves. And Big Heavy World would automate original Vermont made music in between these local DJs. Mm -hmm. And the radio station would be a platform to get the word out about what we're doing and, uh, and for the young people involved to have a whole other, you know, set of skills mm -hmm. to learn. Uh, and Four years after applying in the year 2000, so in 2004, the FCC wow. said, 
you can build the station and if it works we'll put the license in your hand <laughs> and in 2007 we built it it worked they put the license in our hand and so our job is to manage it responsibly enough that the license stays there so we're we're very you know square and formal about operating a licensed community radio station that is hyper local now and although Lee stepped back from the station many years ago we've carried forward the original vision purely yep. and with Lee being honored in you know in in the way this the station is is maintained so and that's a big I mean that's a big thing for musicians in Vermont too is Vermont can be a hard place to launch from and get your music out there and get kind of out of the Shire if you will uh, and, and get it projected so it seems like a natural fit that a local hyper local radio station would be a fabulous uh, soapbox to sort of kind of propel musicians forward and 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 kind of give them the airwaves well it's it's an authentic traditional media outlet mm -hmm. that has a, a proper place in an artist's CV or mm -hmm. you know yeah. press kit. Uh, we also have several shows on the station, including one that Big Heavy World produces, where artists perform and are interviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know there's there's opportunities, which is invaluable to a Vermont artist. There aren't many places that Vermont artists. Um, you know, can get that kind of leverage. And that includes your work um, at Live at the Fort, right? Well, well. That, that's, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, th I think uh, Vermont Public is doing a good job. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I, I have to say thanks out loud to their interest in supporting local mm -hmm. music through their programming. You know, I'm grateful for, for any radio station that is um, supporting local music, recognizing, you know, what we have yeah. in Vermont. It's so special. It is, and the more that we nurture it and incubate it and support it, the more it's able to grow. And, um, you know, that's been a big part of what the mission of Big Heavy World has been and what it's supported over the last 25 years. So thank you, Jim. Oh, you're so sweet about that. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, what is currently something at The Radiator that you want our audience to know about? Oh, geez. Well, the radio station uh, has been a, a, attracting people from the community who want to be a DJ. Mm -hmm. And the evening slots are essentially full. Mm -hmm. The morning and daytime slots are open. And we want it to truly be a voice for the community mm -hmm. inclusively. Okay. So people who would like to present shows on any topic, mm -hmm. any kind of music, in any language, are welcome to come be hosts on the station. So did everybody hear that who's watching right now? If you want to have a morning, afternoon radio show, uh, I know that the website link is at the bottom of the screen right now. Please contact Jim Lockridge. I know that you're out there. Um, so uh, another thing I really want to talk about, which I know has been a labor of love for you for many years now, is that Big Heavy, Heavy World just opened a tiny museum of Vermont music. Woohoo! This, uh, this past September. And so I kind of want to uh, talk to you about it because I haven't really been able to discuss this with you since you opened. Now, how did you pull this together, Jim? Well, I, it came together, I have to give... Uh, a whole lot of credit for the inspiration for this museum to uh, the state's historical society. Mm -hmm. They welcomed us to curate uh, their local history gallery in their museum in Montpelier in 2019. Mm -hmm. And we brought a room full of exhibits together there for the first part of that year. And while that exhibit was up, we were inspired to create space in our office, our studio, for keeping this exhibit available to the public. Wow. And since then, of course, this was a couple of years ago, the exhibits have grown and we've been fortunate enough to bring some significant uh, uh, artifacts to, wow. to present. And the space is becoming very full. You know, we're wondering where do we go from here? <laughs> and it's been a joy to sort of open the doors and then have people contact us and, and offer artifacts. And wow. so we, we take the... What, the, what artifact are you slightly proud of you'd like to tell our audience today? Oh, I, uh, 
I, I'd want to reframe that. I want to say, <laughs> you know, there, the personal pride that I would ever feel towards Big Heavy World is a pride in everybody who ever touched it. Well, that, well that's true. Um, it, yeah. You know, so I, I think that I'm proud of our community at large, both our our the philanthropist supporters, mm -hmm. the people who helped create the exhibit itself, the people who continue to contribute to um, making versions of our exhibits mm -hmm. mobile. Um, a, a, a central item on exhibit these days is uh, the saxophone of Big Joe Burrell. Wow. And it's it's you know like every other artifact it's it it's the starting point for telling a story mm -hmm. and so we're in this very privileged situation of being the conduit mm -hmm. for the story of yep. big joe because people are standing in front of the saxophone mm -hmm. and so we take that responsibility very seriously like we do with other artifacts and you know, the other artifacts are significant as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're stewarding, yeah. we're not owning, we're no. stewarding a door uh, that came from the office of 242 Maine uh, so that we can advocate for the restoration of the 242 Maine program mm -hmm. and put the door back. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, Pete Sutherland contributed a fiddle that he oh. played in the 1970s. He gave us the posters of the festivals in Vermont that he played the fiddle at. So you're almost an archive. It's, it, it, it's like a place where people can, can, can store, uh, you know, artifacts of, of important intent in the, history of, in the history of music in the state. That's, that's the core objective, yes. And, and when I say, you know, we get to tell the story about each artifact, when you walk into the museum, you find the labels, and the labels are brief, but most of them have a QR code, and if you hold your phone up to it, you end up on a web page with a whole lot more about what's going on. And it's the volunteers, the young people who are researching, talking to people in the community, and writing and gathering the media for those extended wow. narratives. So that's sort of been a collaborative effort too, is, 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 is consolidating sort of all the information in the exhibit. Yeah, yeah, it really never stops. So this leads me to my very big question. How does somebody go see the exhibit? Every Wednesday okay. from 6 to 8 p.m., visit us at 4 Howard Street. Okay. It's a big red building called the Howard Space, and our door is behind some apartment looking mailboxes on posts. Okay. There's a red sign. It's on Howard Street, but it's a big building. You got to find our door. Between 4 and 7 on Wednesday. But between 6 and 8 at the moment and mm -hmm. the hours are expanding as our okay. our volunteers become docents while they're working on other projects. Okay. And uh, uh, 6 to 8 is when our crew gets together. So we're there anyway. So could uh, could teachers and uh, faculty at local schools also contact you if they wanted the students to come take a look at it? That would be a dream come true. So if anybody is a teacher out there listening to this and you want to expose your children to the history of Vermont music, please contact Jim Lockridge and go to the museum because it's part of their heritage too. I think it's very important. Um, so here, uh, as, as we finish this conversation, what are the goals and plans for the next 25 years of Big Heavy World? Any thoughts on that? Well, you know, it's, it's one thing to have an imagination and vision. It's another to make a plan to, you know, so we're somewhere in between, I think. Okay. We, we've always been and we remain a very grassroots nonprofit mm -hmm. organization, you know, essentially volunteer run. And uh, my hope, is that ultimately we'll be recognized for the role we've played f for 25 mm -hmm. years, filling a void where the state has not created a music development office for itself. Mm -hmm. Other states like Texas have, oh, yeah. and big cities like Seattle have, mm -hmm. but Vermont and the city of Burlington have just not pointed in that direction. Mm -hmm. And the volunteers of Vermont have filled that gap at Big mm -hmm. Heavy World for many years. And I think we've learned how to do it well enough to stick our hand in the air and say, hey, state of Vermont, if you want a music <laughs> office, you know, you got one. Uh, so, uh, yeah. you know, moving in that We're direction. We're still here. <laughs> yes. Um, so moving on to another, uh, I, know, I know a very personal project for you, um, is sort of the status of Burlington's Memorial Auditorium. 
And um, I think I think it's important to kind of get in, and I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on why Memorial Auditorium is so important to the people of Burlington. Boy, you know, the people of Burlington in 2018 told us directly through more than 2,000, 2,500 survey responses why Memorial is important and what they want to see there. Mm -hmm. uh, a petition that Big Heavy World offered has 2,200 signatures saying, please fix Memorial and put 242 Main back in it, the youth-led cultural space. Memorial is a public commons mm -hmm. in a New England state that has winters. It's the city-owned performing arts mm -hmm. infrastructure. And it has been acknowledged by the city's leadership to have been neglected to the point where it's unsafe and falling down. Mm -hmm. It's the city's obligation to maintain the infrastructure that serves something so vitally important to a community, a space to get together, especially in a period of history where we've been torn apart by the pandemic. You know, it's a, it's a platform for bringing us together, making us stronger, reminding us we're a community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the home of 242 Maine, which, you know, two so so that's where I'm going to go into next too. Is I wanted to um, I wanted to talk to you about 242 story because I know it's an integral part of uh, your story, and uh, so I, I wanted to talk to you about that. What is the history of 242 for some of our viewers who might not know what that space was and what it gave to the Burlington art scene? Um, so happy to to share this. You know, young people who have become teenagers or young adults after 2016 when it closed, won't have this kind of insight. Um, mm -hmm. In the 1980s, Bernie Sanders was mayor. Mm -hmm. He created a youth office. The youth office created a teen-led space mm -hmm. in the basement of Memorial Auditorium. It's essentially you know, a, a cinder block box, but the kids owned it. You know, I, they, I, full disclosure, I actually went there as a teen, so I should note that. Um. So, so this space existed with the city's support for young people to have the experience of being creative for one another mm -hmm. or messaging to each other, like from stage, the mm -hmm. patter of, of bands between songs, you know, the important things that had to be said, youth to youth were said there, and, and the examples were set for being critical minded, mm -hmm. for having the confidence to present to one another, to share, and to be part of a community. Mm -hmm. And most of the youth that attended 242 Maine, I think it's, a, it's common wisdom, um, would have felt marginalized mm -hmm. otherwise. Yep. But this was their safe space. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a critical resource to any community. And I, and I remember at the time when Bernie helped set it up too, for him, it was a public workspace that, you know, these children might not have a place to go, not might have a place to gather, to be themselves, to, to, to work together in a common space of community, and that that was going to be there for them. And, and, you know, you do have to question, now that the city lacks that, um, you know, what it's lost, um, which I do think is an important point. Well, there's, there's tragedy in this story. The silver lining is there is now the catalyst for having a public conversation about these values. Yep. The tragedy is when Memorial was closed, forcing 242 Main to close, there was no comment from anybody in city's leadership about the importance of this kind of resource. Mm -hmm. There was no program direction to reestablish teen-led cultural space somewhere else in the city. Mm -hmm. That entire demographic who every city leader serves, mm -hmm. was not served mm -hmm. when 242 Main was closed. Oh, sad. And it has been a challenge to bring the understanding, the value statement that teens deserve that kind of attention and service and resource mm -hmm. to city leaders, whether it's the, the, the mayor's ad administration or city councilors. Well, how do you get future leaders if they don't have a space in which how to learn leadership? Um, you know, it seems to be pit and parcel of the same question, um, and it is it is a tragedy. So, what do you what do you foresee as the future of two forty two? Well, at this point, you know, I'll, I'll, before I answer that, I'll lay a couple things out. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is two forty two Main existed for more than thirty years. Yep. The kids programmed it. 
Mm -hmm. The kids program, for the most part, aggressive music, making 242 Maine uh, the longest running all ages punk rock venue in the country. As a teen led cultural space rematerializes in Burlington, I believe we've all learned lessons about being purposeful about inclusion. Mm -hmm. I think the programming um, and the kids that are involved will become more diverse mm -hmm. and the programming will as well. Um, so when I say, you know, when you and I talk about 242 Maine of the future, I think that we're, we're talking about evolving the model that we're- Yes, a, a grassroots organization in, in the scope of Big Heavy World. And this leads me to my next thing. My, I, I do want to have a quick pitch here um, for a very important organization that Jim and I uh, do work on, uh, the Vermont Creative Network Chittenden County. Uh, this is an organization that uh, Jim and I both work on. Um, and I've been uh, trying to promote and to uh, foster uh, support um, in Chittenden County for. The more the membership grows, the more feedback we get from you, um, the more dynamic the network will become. Um, you will see uh, information on the screen um, for how to get involved in this network if you're watching this right now. So please uh, follow the uh, information on the screen or get in touch with Jim and I. Um, about it because, uh, you know, that's another grassroots organization that we can pool our collective consciousness and grow from. Um, if there is one continuous thread through this entire conversation, um, I would suggest that uh, everything comes from the community. And, uh, you know, that's sort of the architecture uh, of a lot of your work. I've known Jim for many years now. Um, is that, is, is that the, the, the infrastructure is there in the community and it grows from itself in an organic process. It, it can when the community comes together. Yeah. You know, we have to acknowledge that it takes, it takes a decision to be made that mm -hmm. people will work together. So this is the call to action to you know, <laughs> get in <laughs> did, touch, come work with did, us. Did everybody hear that? Um, so there's been some great information today um, at the bottom of the screen for all of you. Um, if you wanna reach out to Jim, uh, his blog, uh, Big Heavy World, The Radiator, again, they're looking for, um, they're working for content during the day and mornings, so please reach out if you have interest in that. And also, please try to reach out to us, because we are trying to create a dynamic, um, creative uh, community here in Chittenden County, and we'd love to hear from you, because we are the sum of our parts. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for all the wonderful work you've done. Um, over the past 25 years, uh, Burlington is a more dynamic and uh, remarkable city because you're in it. Um, and I appreciate everything you've done. And um, thank you all so much for being here with us today on the waterfront. Um, it's been a wonderful time. And uh, we'll see you right back here next month. Thank you.